short-term regulation. How do I tell my heart to beat slower? What's What type of parasympathetic? Let's do that. So if my blood pressure climbs short-term, that's the most annoying sound on the planet. <laughs> So if my blood pressure is going up short term, I just woke up, I just crawled upstairs, whatever your framework is, you're going to increase the parasympathetic response. Remind me for your final exam what that means in English. Parasympathetic is what? Rest, Rest and digest. What happens to my heart rate in parasympathetic? It goes down. So I lower my pulse. I also lower my stroke volume a little bit and therefore I'm lowering my overall pressure. Right. So I just tell my heart to beat less often, beat less hard, thereby reducing my pressure. Make sense? What do you think would happen if my blood pressure all of a sudden went down too fast? What do you think my body would do? Take a guess. Increase my sympathetic response. Fight or flight. So what should your heart do when you're scared? Increase faster, makes it harder, so I get more stroke volume, and that's going to raise my blood pressure. So in a short term, sitting there right now taking notes, your body's going to turn on fight or flight to speed up your pressure, raise it, or increase your rest and digest to lower your pressure. So every time you get out of your chair, your pressure rises, your body has to calm it down, right? and vice versa. So as you're falling asleep in my lecture, your body has to use sympathetic to ratchet up the pressure. Make sense? That's short-term response. Right? Over here, we're going to do a long-term response. Long-term meaning days, two months. Day in, day out. Also called chronic. If your blood pressure is always high, or if your blood pressure is always low, right? If you think about it, if my blood pressure is always high, I can't keep parasympathetic-ing it to nowhere, right? I mean, at some point it doesn't work. So your body has to have another way to do this. So it's going to use hormones. So in the long-term effect, we're going to start using our, the hormones instead of the nervous system to tell your body what to do. So here we have some blood pressure long term. Oh, I'm going to go up a little bit. I went too far. There we go. Long term. So here's my long term days and weeks and months. All right, so let's do that. What's happening to my blood pressure here? Why is it going down? Yeah, my blood's on the floor now, right? So I have less fluid, in, I got a leak in my hose, the pressure drops. So you go to the Red Cross, you give them blood, it's going to take you a month to make more, right, from EPO. So you're going to have a month of sitting there with less pressure than you had before. Well, I can't keep fight or fighting, so I got to do something else. So you're going to turn on a bunch of hormones to try to compensate. So let's figure out where that goes. Click on my kidney. That's a strange place to kick. Click. Kidneys are screaming, no, no, no. <laughs> and next time you'll learn kidneys' job is to clean your blood. So they need to have pressure to clean it. They run out of pressure, they scream. But they're going to make a hormone. So we're going to make go through a big, long list of steps here, about six or so. So if my blood pressure is low all the time, every day, all day, it's going to be detected by my kidneys. What else do kidneys do with blood besides detect the blood pressure? Mm -hmm. Right. The EPO thing, remember they detected the oxygen level. So kidneys do a lot. So 
Saladin says the juxtaglomerular apparatus, that's what he's talking about here. So my kidneys are going to scream, my blood pressure is too low. They're going to make a hormone. So step number two, the kidneys make a hormone. Insert joke now. All right. What is that hormone called? We look on the screen. Actually, the enzyme called renin with one end. You can call it an enzyme, you can call it a, a hormone, because really it's an enzymatic hormone. But we're going to make renin. So I'm going to make an increase in renin in my body. So my kidneys make renin. whoop de doo Let's now figure out what renin's going to do. There's renin, the big green blob on the screen. You don't have to ever draw that. It's a cat fan. Renin's going to travel around. Blah, 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 blah. It's going to bind to something and make angiotensin 1. Medical terminology, what's angio mean? Vessel. Right. Vessel. Tensin? What do you think that sounds like? I, tension. So tensioning my blood vessel number 1, which helps you at no point. But step number 3, renin is going to activate, turn on, convert, whatever word you want. Pick a word you prefer. Angiotensin number one in the blood. Right, so my kidneys make renin. It's a hormone that travels in my blood. Finds and makes angiotensin number one. That's now that little thing there. So let's click that. Here's my renin. Here we go. Blah, 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 blah. There's the precursor, we call it. Wow! I don't hear it going, wow. Okay, angiotensin number one. So I've now made another hormone slash enzyme, angiotensin one. If there's a number one, guess what's next? Two. two. Number two. So we're going to send angiotensin one to your lungs. So step number four, I'll put over here. Step four. Angiotensin 1 becomes angiotensin 2 at the lungs. So you made 1 become number 2. And there's a name for the thing that does that. It's a name that will haunt you in medicine. Because every old man in the town is on it. The enzyme. Anyone know what the enzyme is called that converts angiotensin? Take a guess. Angiotensin converting enzyme. This is supposed to be hard. Every doctor you're going to meet is going to call that an ACE. If you know someone on an ACE inhibitor, now you can place it here. They're blocking angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2 at the lung. It's called the ACE enzyme. So, or angiotensin conversion enzyme. So here is ACE, this funny looking blabo. That's ACE. It's going to take number 1 and make number 2. Let's do that. Everyone ready? It doesn't get better than this. 1. There's two. Yeah, hey, that wasn't worth the ticket price, was it? But we're not done yet. Because now we have step number five. Angiotensin number two goes somewhere. Goes to the adrenal gland. All right, specifically the cortex. All right, name me some hormones on your final exam that come from the adrenal cortex. Aldosterone. Aldosterone is one. Corticoid. Mineral corticoids, the androgen, right? All those cortico kind of things. Well, let's figure out which one we're going to talk about. There. So angiotensin stimulates, ooh, aldosterone. There it is. You release aldosterone. A 
aldosterone, if you remember, was a mineral corticoid. Some remember from their big chart from hell what the job of aldosterone was. Increase salt, retain salt, reabsorb salt. So what's going to happen in step six is you're going to retain sodium in the body, specifically the blood. So more salt in my body. In 112 biology, what does salt do to water? It attracts water from osmosis. Step number seven, it's going to increase water retention. Which is going to increase the fluids in the vessels. And what do I do if I put more fluid in your vessel? What will happen to the pressure if there's more water? It should go up. So at the end of the day, I will increase your blood pressure by increasing the water in your blood, volume-wise, because there's more salt in my body, because there's more mineral corticoids in my body, because there's more geotensin in my body. So you're retaining salt to retain water to retain pressure, basically. So let's watch that up close and personal. I'm sure you're just waiting with bated breath. All right. Let's do that by going here. Ah, no way. So we're going to do it by, oh, not that one. Back up one. I'll move too far. Here we go. So we're going to do a little chain of command kind of thing. I love these little games. It's what I do for fun. Let's assume that you're bleeding out at the Red Cross, you had a car wreck, you're hemorrhaging, whatever, and your blood is now on the floor. That means your pressure went with it. What will happen to Ren if you have low chronic blood pressure? No. Should go up. Which should make angiotensin 1 do what? Up. up. Which should make angiotensin 2 go up. up. Which make aldosterone go, uh, catching on. Which makes my sodium go, uh, which makes my water go. Uh, right. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to turn on all these hormones to basically turn on the salt and water to raise your pressure long term. Now let's say your blood pressure is always high long term, every day, all day, like my dad. What do you think your kidneys will do about the level of renin if it's high blood pressure? Decrease. Decrease it. So we'll do that. So we'll change these. If you have high blood pressure, you're going to decrease renin, which will do what to angiotensin? Decrease angiotensin, which will decrease aldosterone, which will decrease salt, and decrease water. Hence the ACE inhibitor. If I block angiotensin, I block my ability to raise my pressure. Right, this is like a long-term strategy. So we'll do that on the wall of glory here. If, like my dad's blood pressure, is sky high, his kidney should have stopped making renin, to stop making angiotensin, to stop making aldosterone, to stop making sodium, stay in, to stop getting water in, which should eventually make his pressure go down. So if you work at the nursing home, people on ACE inhibitors are also on diuretics or water pills. The more I pee, the less of this fluid is in my pipes. So they're trying to lower the pressure by making you pee all day long. My dad's on two ACE inhibitors and two diuretics, so they're trying to stop this and make him pee. Still isn't working. Okay. Make sense? This is a long-term strategy. So short-term, I just get excited, fight or flight, or I relax, rest, and digest. Long-term, I play with hormones. So when you wake up in the morning, you're not going to change your renin levels. You're just going to change your sympathetic response. But if every day, all day, your blood pressure is low, then you crank up renin and your system. Yes? So what's going wrong in your diet's body that you're going to send it down? So I these nuts? Oh, I'm sorry. Did that come out? <laughs> they don't know. Um, some people have, um, there's a phrase for it, it escapes me, but like an over 
active angiotensin. So the angiotensin is more efficient than it should be, so it raises the pressure too much. You have too many receptors. That's genetic. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes the kidneys become um, basically uh, downregulated or upregulated <laughs> in some people. So the kidneys are misreading how much pressure is normal. And so they're over-making renin or under-making renin, depending on the person. Um, they can, it's like habituation with drugs. At some point, the kidneys kind of forget that 200 is probably too high. And so 200 becomes the new normal. And so they do that way, which happened in him. His, his, his systolic was 230. Wow. <laughs> it should have killed him then. <laughs> so that's why they block the, 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 the uh, ACE is, well, we don't know why this is wrong. We can stop that. So if, it, if your blood pressure just gets that high, you don't do anything to fix it, you're just going to die pretty soon. Pretty much. It's like, again, the analogy is take a fire truck and push it through a garden hose. Right? That much pressure is not how your vessels are built. So the vessels are going to break more often. You get aneurysms. You're going to blow up the capillaries in your brain. That's a stroke. You're going to blow out your kidney capillaries. They're going to blow up. You have migraines every day. I think my dad would have figured out 10 years of migraines. Probably something. Yeah. Um, you know, and all this stuff because you're going to block your eyes because the retina has blood up. So basically, you just force more fluid in every possible tube more often to basically break. Yeah. So he's break. cataracts. Yeah. yeah. Coma, cataracts, macular degeneration. Because I was a diabetic, so diabetics get more blood pressure from being thicker, they run the same kind of category. It's harder. He's not diabetic, though, right? I know, he's not. Aren't you going to say something? <laughs> You can bring it up all the time. <laughs> I can <laughs> rule those on insulin and solve all my problems. <laughs> so my mom was diabetic. Type 2. Yeah. My dad is not. The one thing he doesn't have, he has an aneur abdominal aneurysm that's about ready to blow out. He's had four or five strokes. Oh my goodness. He fires his doctor again. Uh, <laughs> dementia is fantastic. Right. You're okay on this. So we're going to just make a graph of this process. Let's make a graph. It's on the screen in a different way. But let's make a graph. And then we'll do some immunity. So over here, we got blood pressure, time, and we're going to do short term. So right now, as you're getting stressed out, your blood pressure's climbing up. How could I reduce my blood pressure short term? By peeing more. Well, short term, that's long term. Oh, sure. Meditate. Yeah, meditate would make me have more what? Parasympathetics. I'm going to increase my rest and digest. Meditation, think happy thoughts, go have a burger, whatever. I'm going to then turn on my rest and digest. Therefore, my blood pressure should drop over time. If you don't like the increasing parasympathetic, you could also have argued you're going to decrease your sympathetic. Remember your dual innervation, they work as opposites. So I either stress out less or I relax more, but that would lower my pressure. Let's say it's just not high enough today. You just need more. How can I get my blood pressure up? Do the reverse. I'm going to increase my fight or flight. Take AMP, that'll raise your blood pressure. Or I just stop relaxing. Right? Stop my meditation, whatever. And that would cause my heart rate to speed up, and therefore my pressure would then level back out to 120 over 80. Right? Let's make this a long-term graph. I'll use green for long-term. So we'll do long-term. So long-term, if my blood pressure is too high long-term, how could my body lower it? Very good. I'm going to reduce all that stuff, right? Here's a shortcut on an exam. The shortcut for what you just learned is called the RAS, or the RAS system. Can that we stands, say that? Yeah. <laughs> Renin, angiotensin, aldosterone system. So if you just write RAS on a test, I understand you mean all those steps. I got it. So I'm just going to write up here that you're going to decrease your RAS, right? You're going to decrease renin, which decreases angiotensin, which decreases aldosterone, to reduce your pressure. And if I don't have enough pressure long term, how can I make more? Give me some more RAS. 
Remember, your brain had a RAS, too. That's a different RAS. That's 1A. This is 2. Give me more renin. Give me more salt. Salt sucks. So when you talk to the, your friends in the nursing field, they'll be talking about renin and angiotensin and RAS quite a bit. Okay? It's a very common thing for them to mention. Make sense? That's long-term regulation of blood pressure in short term. You okay? Mm -hmm. All right. That sort of ends now the cardiovascular section of this exercise. And now we're going to go to my favorite body system, which is the immune system. Catch a joke yet? No one's ever catching it. You've got to do that. You're always my favorite, right? Yeah. All right. Let's do immune system. We'll start today and try to do it by Monday and Wednesday. I'll leave that up. I'll put up our. Someone tell me why you have an immune system. So you don't die. So you don't die. Die from what? Death. Death. Pathogens, right? <laughs> so Saladin will throw the pathogen word at you. Pathogen just means some kind of foreign thing. So it could be a virus, could be bacteria, could be anything that's trying to eat me alive. Be considered a pathogen. We're going to try stopping foreign things from getting in. The Border Patrol basically plays its job, but they don't have very well. Right? So, you're going to learn the concept of defense and death. A military term, actually. So, in yonder medieval times, to get the fair Rapunzel in the tower, what did you have to cross over to get to the tower to move the castle? The drawbridge over the moat, there's a dragon, right? You gotta go through the, the flaming oil, right? So you had to get through multiple defenses to actually get in and cause problems. Your body's built the same way. There's multiple places to keep things out. The outermost defense, the moat of your body, is called a barrier. Name the most important barrier, what was it? Skin. Skin is a kind of barrier. If I have skin, you stay out. What else besides skin is a barrier? Hair. Hair, which is on skin. I heard someone say mucus. Yeah, maybe snot is your friend. Uh, body fluids. Name some. Uh, tears. Tears. Every time you blink your eye, you're going to coat it with a barrier. Does what your else? skin have like an acid mantle or some kind of acidic? Yes. So things like sweat and oil all contain salts. Remember from 1 to 12 nature enzymes, and pH differences. What else besides sweat, oil, and tears? Saliva. Saliva has immunological property. Other bacteria. Other bacteria are microfauna. So as long as someone else is living there, you can't move in. Squatters. Okay? You gotta live in the house to keep people out. What else? Was it? <laughs> That's actually later. Bob. You're missing one in your ear. White blood cells. Wax. Wax. Uh, the phagocytes in your lungs, the big ones. Macrophages. Mm, they actually don't count in this category. They're next. There's more. Hair. Oh. What cilia. Hair. In your case, cilia. In the airway. Oh, let me throw some at you. How about some stomach acid? You swallow that cheeseburger, the stomach acid is outside your body, right? And it's destroying whatever's in the E. coli special. Where else do you have acid besides in your stomach? You're supposed to do this with an urchin sting. Urine? Urine, you're out. As long as your urine is acidic, you don't get as many bacterial infections. You kind of caught the joke, all right. Right. Where else do you have acid besides pee and stomachs? Your fashion. You do, not mine, but yours. Right. <laughs> Vaginal acidity. <clears throat> so these are all things that if they're working, stuff can't get in. So as long as I don't have cuts and I have sweat and 
mucus and snot and all that fun stuff. Something can't get in. But you go outside and someone cuts you. So now I've broken through the barrier. Things move in, right? So what's round two? What comes after barriers to keep you alive? Inflammation. Inflammation! Yeah! <laughs> so it's round two. It's called inflammatory response. Inflammation. Bring in the white blood cells. Bring in the white blood cells. So how do you know something's inflamed? There's oh. puffy. Puffy. Red. Red. Hot. Hot. That's different. Yeah. Pain? Oh, yeah, pain. Maybe some itch. Okay, why is it all these? What's making it all that? It's in the air. Yes? Yeah, Alright. Due to an increase in histamine. Does it increase the um, sympathetic response? Not directly. Okay. There, wouldn't, there might be because you just got tacked or something, but not directly. Okay. So this is due to an increase in histamine, which is a chemical messenger that's supposed to do something. It also increases the white blood cell mobility. Okay, remind me what white blood cells are for. Killing, Kill things. killing things. So we're calling in the troops. We're mobilizing the army. Someone broke in, sound the alarm, bring in the troops. All right? And... Going to increase the permeability. How's that for a big word? Of capillaries. Okay, let's spell capillary right. Okay, what were capillaries? What were they? Small they blood did blood exchanges. Blood. Right, exchanges, small blood vessels. Why do I want my capillaries to get quote leaky? What do I want to leak out of them? Blood cells. These. I want the troops to get off the highway and go door to door fighting, basically. So I have to let them out of their thing. So if I make my capillaries leaky and I have more blood floating around, hmm, I wonder what color I'd be. Red. I wonder, would I get bigger? Yes. Would it hurt? Yes. Would it be hot? Yes. Would it probably itch? Yes. That's because I'm getting leakier tubing and more blood cells at the front fighting. Right? Let me show you, I'm not making this up much. I'm going to show you a picture of inflammation. I'll show you an animation of said inflammation. So, on this picture, I'm going to Okay, from 231, that's your skin, right? There's your epidermis. Okay, here's the knife wound from the bar and sio. Here comes the tetanus coming on in, right? Pathogens have broken through the barrier. They're raising hell. we got to kill them, right? So there's these chemical alarm signals, one of which would be histamine, that sends out the alarm. Call the troops, okay? Well, down here, here's my blood vessel, like capillary. Hey, that's a neutrophil, right? But he's down there, they're up there. How do I get him out of there? Glad you asked. Look what we're doing here. Here they come. Here comes my army out of my blood vessels. They're moving to the front. They're rushing the gate, rescuing the maiden, whatever. And they're trying to attack the invaders. And notice I'm looking red and hot and swollen and all that because I'm having a war under my skin. Eventually, they eat the little invaders my swelling goes away, and life is better. Make sense? That's the inflammatory response. So my inflaming is a result of breaking my barrier, and now I'm fighting off somebody. To show you that I'm not making this up much more, let me show you another picture here of this going on. This is showing, this would be some kind of white blood cell, probably a neutrophil. Here's my bad guy. He broke in. Got to kill him. I eat him. Phagocyte means to eat him, and you can laugh now. Here I go. Hey, remember Biology 112? What was the lysosome doing? What were they for? Digestion. Digestion, right? Moving waste, the janitor of the cells. So here comes my janitor. Breaks the bad guy into pieces. And then you poop out his guts, and you move on. <laughs> okay. okay. Next time you have a zit on your face, think about... How you know it's a zit? What color are your zits? White. 
which is they're red. So they can't go on. Let's, let's go with that one, right? They're red, they're puffy, they hurt, they itch. Because your skin got what? Inflamed. Inflamed. Something went into your pores, broke into your skin, raising hell. White blood cells attack. And then when you pop your zits on the mirror, am I the one that misses that? What comes squirting out of the zit? That's poop from your white blood cells. Right? You're squirting their guts and the guts of what they ate all over your mirror. After letting your mom do that. <laughs> you're laughing, but you'll never forget it. <laughs> That's what you're doing is you're destroying, you're pushing that old fluid out of that spot. But that means there's an infection, something got in your skin, and your body's trying to fight it off. That's inflammation. Anytime you swell, that's what you're doing. Is that the only way to get a zit? Is something going into your... Not necessarily. You can also get them from allergic reactions. And other but the most common thing is you, you get all this oil when you're in puberty. The oil basically traps bacteria in the pore. They decide to breed because what else do bacteria do? They start chewing on you. Your body then attacks, and then you repeat with nausea. That's why you can take antibiotics and remove your acne. The problem is you also get also the problems. Make sense? Let me show you an animation of this process, not the popping zit part, although you can. Um, let me show you an animation of this process. Just a second here. I know you're waiting intently. <clears throat> The inflammatory response is an important, non-specific defense against tissue damage. Okay, there's a word. What's it mean, non-specific defense? Innate. Innate also can mean what? Automatic. Automatic and also attacks anything, anywhere, right? Non-specific means no matter what's breaking in, I'll try to kill it. Next week we'll learn about the specific defense. It means I only kill one thing one way. But this means anything that breaks into my skin, I'm going to attack. So it doesn't matter if it's a zit, a sticker from a rose bush, whatever, a knife wound from the bar, I'm going to attack it basically the same way. It doesn't matter what it is. It's a non-specific or generalized defense. It begins when injured tissue cells release chemical signals that activate the endothelial cells of nearby capillaries. Within the capillaries, adhesion molecules called selectins are displayed on the activated endothelial cells. You never have to know that. These adhesion molecules no. attract neutrophils, slow them down, and cause the neutrophils to roll along the endothelium. Thank you. As the neutrophils roll along the endothelium, they encounter chemicals that activate integrins, which are adhesion receptors on their surfaces. These integrins then tightly attach to adhesion receptor molecules on the endothelial cells. This causes the neutrophils to stick to the endothelium and stop rolling. Why would we want them to stop here? So they can break through. They can break through. Remember, they're, they're going all the way through your bloodstream. Well, it doesn't do good to have the army in Panama when someone's attacking Alaska. So you want them to stop here. So you're trying to get the white blood cells to stop at the front so they can break through. I'm never going to ask about integrins or all that stuff. This accumulation of neutrophils along the walls of the capillary is referred to as margination. Good for it. The inflammatory mediators released by the injured tissue bring about changes in the environment that cause mast cells to degranulate and release histamine. There's the main one. Histamine is the major player in this event. So when you had a bee sting and you're getting all swollen up, your mom gave you something, what did she give you? Antihistamine, because if I block histamine, I block the inflammation. So you won't swell, you won't get leaky, you won't get puffy, you won't get itchy. Therefore, you can go to school and not cry. Right? Yes? What is the point, then, of having it? Like, why would, if your body's responding like that to get rid of something, yep. why would you work against that? Um, good is question. That, that is an question? ethical question. Oh. Yeah, the, one of the things is comfort, right? If you have a bee sting on your face... You're going to look like some kind of Frankenstein creature, right? It's going to be hard to breathe and see. So comfort outweighs the cost. But you're right. If you have a sticker and you antihistamine yourself, you stop your immune system from doing its job. Yeah. So as a parent, I just let my kids suffer and say, well, unless it's, not, unless it's on your face, you're just going to have to itch because it's doing its job. I raise honeybees, and I get stung all the time. And you just let it, unless it's your face, just sit there and cry. 
That's funny. <laughs> what about like a spider bite? Ben, the recluse spider goes see somebody because it'll rot your arm off. But most insects things are simply going to do inflammation. So you get a wasp thing or bee sting, you swell up, it hurts, it itches, you feel miserable for a day, you go to sleep, tomorrow morning it's fine, your immune system took care of the poison. But that is a question, how much antihistamine do you want? But let's go Histamine there. causes vasodilation and an opening of the junctions between the endothelial cells, allowing fluid and leukocytes to leave the capillary and enter the infected tissue. Here comes the army. The neutrophils now undergo dramatic changes in shape and squeeze through the endothelial wall into the interstitial tissue fluid. Yeah. This process is called extravasation. Never ever the neutrophils, that. followed by other types of phagocytes, are attracted to the damaged site oh, by chemotactic <laughs> substances released by bacteria and tissue breakdown yes, products. Yes. They ingest and destroy invading bacteria. So again, we're calling troops to the front. Okay, let's assume that this is working or it's not working, but somehow you need more, more defense. So let's say you have a bad infection, you broke the barriers, you have swelling. What's the next thing you could do to fight off an emitter? What's round three? Hmm? No, no, this is working fine. No, it's usually after the next one. Lymph. System. So we're going to talk about your lymph system for the rest of the day. So to understand your lymph system, you have to kind of get the gist of this weasel word, lymph. All right. Lymph is simply a fluid. It's a fluid in a particular spot. So let's go through some fluids. Can someone tell me where plasma fluid is? Blood. That's in my blood. Okay. Try this one. Can someone remember from some cell biology class where interstitial is? In between the cells. Okay. Lymph. Is the same as those, but it's the used fluid you're draining away. So lymph is drained or draining interstitial fluid. Blah, blah, blah. So the fluid in your plasma goes around your cells. And we call it interstitial by magic. The fluid around your cells we eventually drain away, we call it lymph. And where do you drain it to? Where's it going to go to drain? It's basically going to go right back to your blood, and we call it plasma again. So there's no difference conceptually in these fluids, there's just a difference in name. So if you're draining it, it's lymph. If you're in the blood, it's blood. So it's just a silly analogy, but it works. If you turn on a faucet in the bathroom, that's fresh water when it's in the faucet. The minute it touches the drain, it's now what? Dirty, yucky. Sewage, right? Mm -hmm. All that changed was the name because of the location, not what it was. So you're changing the name of the fluid, not so much what the fluid is. So let me give you a perception here of this so you can grasp this concept. Because for a long time, I've kept wondering, what's this stinking lymph junk? Well, lymph junk is that. <clears throat> so here's my blood, red and blue. Plasma, you'd call it. Here's now my fluid around the cells, which we call tissue fluid or interstitial. Now it's going to become lymph because I'm draining it away. So once it becomes a drainage or sewage, it's now lymph. And I'm going to take that lymph, I'm going to drain it and drain it and drain it to there. Where's that? Yeah. And why would I want to put it back there? Why do I want it back in my blood? It's clean and I can do what with my water? I can reuse it, right? So you're reusing the same fluid over and over and over. You're taking it from your blood to your cells, to your cells to the drain, to drain to the blood, back to the cells. Reduce, reuse, recycle. So I can keep using the same fluid over and over again. 
But there's a problem. What happens if something's in my fluid? And it ends up here. What would happen if bacteria got to my heart? Where would they be next? Everywhere. 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 What does the heart do? Sends blood everywhere. everywhere. You just lost the war. That's called sepsis, right? Infections in your blood, now it's everywhere. So for this to work, I have to clean the fluid before it gets back to my heart. So just like your car has filters on the oil that you constantly reuse, you have a filter right there. What do we call the filters? Lymph nodes. Lymph nodes. So we're going to use lymph nodes to filter the fluids as we keep reusing them over and over again. So let's talk about lymph nodes for a minute. These are simply a filter for the lymph, just like the name says. I'm not filtering the plasma or anything, I'm fi filtering the drainage, right? So they look green here, they look green, fine. So let's, let's zoom in on a lymph node, just to see what we're looking at here. Here's a close-up of one lymph node. Right? So here's some fluid coming in that's, quote, dirty. Here's some fluid going out, which hopefully is clean, quote, quote. And here's a big filter stuck between the two. Right? What do you think lives in a lymph node? Lymphocytes. Lymphocytes, right, live in my lymph nodes. So the lymph nodes are full of white blood cells. You want an army living there to clean the blood, specifically lots and lots of lymphocytes. So lymphocytes live in my lymph system. That's their job, is to clean the fluid as it comes passing on by. Right. Make sense? What about natural killer cells? Uh, they're, part, they're kind of a T lymphocyte, kind of. I lump them with T lymphocytes. Right, they'd be in there. Let's do a kid our lymph nodes. All right, so here's a question for you. Let's go back a page. How does the fluid actually get moved in my lymph system? They're, they're not, it's not like it's in the heart's pushing on it, it's all open. Valve valves. Va ah, <laughs> Notice we have valves, right? What were the job of valves last week? To move. Prevent backflow. So as the lymph moves, the valves keep it from going in reverse because there's no heart attached to this system. It's a drainage system. Think about it, there's no pump on your toilet, right? You just push the lever, stuff goes down the pipe. Same concept here. As the fluid drains, it's just going to move back through the valves, and it can only get closer and closer to my heart because it can't go in reverse. Right? If you look at this lymph node, look up here. See the little flaps? There are valves that say once you get in, you can't get out unless you go through the filter and pop out this way. So it's a passive sort of system just like your veins were. There's no pressure, so you have to use valving. Okay. To show you I'm not making this up, I actually have an animation of that. I know you care so. Let me show you this animation. It's right here. The lymphatic system consists of a network of vessels and tissues that contain and transport lymph. Yep. Lymph forms from interstitial fluid in lymphatic capillaries and flows through lymph vessels and nodes, eventually returning to the blood vessels. So in English, it's all the fluids, tissue fluid, plasma fluid, whatever's leaking around, and you're going to drain it back to the blood vessels. So. You have a yard, right? That's the drainage thing in your yard. As all that irrigation flows down there, you're going to drain it back into the city kind of thing. So we're just draining fluid. It works closely with the circulatory system and is structured similarly with its own capillaries and vessels. The lymphatic system has three primary functions. Draining excess interstitial fluid from tissue and blood. So we drain fluid. Transporting dietary lipids and promoting disease resistance. Okay, we'll talk about 
talk more about the lipid thing next term in 233. But the one we're focusing on is for draining fluid. That's its job. And then as I drain the fluid, I can filter out pathogens or diseases. So I get two for one. I drain and I clean. All right, so you get two. Click on the vessel. Let's do that. I just did. Due to pressure differences between blood vessels and interstitial space, significant amounts of fluid and solutes filter out of the blood and are not reabsorbed. Each day, about 20 liters of fluid and solutes are filtered out of capillaries at the arterial end. About 17 liters are returned back to the bloodstream at the venous end. The remaining three liters of fluid and solutes drain from blood and tissues into lymphatic vessels. So you think about the math there. You, you use 17, kept it. You got three extra liters lying in the yard somewhere. You gotta drain that and clean it up. So that's the job is to get that excess fluid out of there. If you block the lymph vessels, what would you see in a patient? They just start to swell up, right? If I can't drain the fluid, it just fills me up. So edema, which we'll talk about next term, is one factor of the lymph system. You just can't drain your fluid. So high blood pressure would affect the system? Yeah, so or the reverse. This affects the pressure if you get too much fluid. Click on the vessel. We'll turn it down. The lymphatic system also absorbs lipids and lipid-soluble vitamins, A, D, E, and K, via lacteals in the small intestine. That's next term. That's kind of nice. Macrophage cells found in the lymph nodes and spleen phagocytize invading cells. B lymphocyte cells in lymph nodes and the spleen produce antibodies that mark and destroy foreign antigens in cells. Right. So again, we're going to use those filters to also do with some immunity, the lymphocytes, which we'll talk more on Monday about specific jobs. So. The unique structure of lymphatic capillaries allows fluid inflow from interstitial space, but not outflow. Well, Overlapping not? endothelial cells make up the wall of the lymphatic capillary. Anchoring filaments hold the cells in place. Drainage occurs as pressure in the interstitial fluid increases, causing swelling. The anchored filaments pull the endothelial cells slightly apart, allowing more fluid to flow into the lymphatic capillary. When pressure is greater inside the lymphatic capillary, drainage stops and the endothelial cells overlap tightly to prevent lymph outflow. So we have extra fluid they're draining away. The lymphatic system returns drained lymph to the bloodstream through lymphatic ducts. The right lymphatic duct drains the upper right side of the body. The thoracic duct drains the rest of the body. The ducts bring drained fluid to the right and left subclavian veins. You should not know where those are after your lab, right? Mm -hmm. Just you as trivia, you're not symmetric. Part of your body goes on one side and most of the body goes on the other side. But the idea is the same. I'm draining fluid and putting it basically right next to your heart to be reused. Yes? Well, I mean, this is a dumb question, but why? I mean, like, one side only does a quarter of your body yeah. and the other side does the whole thing? Yep. Wouldn't the other side mm -hmm. kind of get backed up? I didn't build it. <laughs> so, I, yeah, I mean, I would think the well, symmetric would make more sense, but. Does it vary? Why brain crisscross, you know. Does really it different. vary between women and men or like races? Not that I've heard. And there's individual variation in tubing, but not in any real. Not that I've ever heard any anatomical. Why is the bone green? Skeletal muscle and respiratory okay. pumping okay. promotes the flow of lymph toward the thoracic and right lymphatic ducts. The same processes return venous blood to the heart. And that's something to think about. Remember, to move your veins, we had to move or breathe because there's no pressure. So there's no pressure in your lymph system. It's the same thing. As I move and breathe, I squeeze these capillaries, and the valves then kick in, just like your veins. So your veins and your lymph system are very similar in their plumbing because there's no heart at all attached to this one. 
Right. Click on the leg. Okay. Let's do that. There you go. Valves in the lumen of lymphatic vessels and veins keep flow proceeding in one direction. The pumping moves fluid in three steps. One, at rest, both valves are open and fluid flows toward the heart. Two, muscle contraction compresses the vessel, pushing fluid through the open proximal valve. The distal valve is closed, preventing backflow. Three, as the muscle relaxes, the proximal valve closes and the distal valve opens, resuming flow. This process essentially milks the fluid from the vessel, transporting it toward the heart. Like your veins, right? Similar concept. Sense. I think that's the last part. Yeah. So, but that's the idea. So as I'm draining this fluid, I'm also going to clean it up as it goes through. So we're going to learn now, let's go back to our pictures of the lymph nodes. And look at them sort of up in general where they're located. So not even everywhere. Let me show you this picture right. I lost that picture. It should be right here. Did I lose my lift note? Hmm. Ah, there it is. Here's Green Man. Okay. So you know these words, so this should make sense. Your cervical nose would be where? In my neck. We call them a tonsil, formally. But the idea is, if something gets in my mouth and begins to destroy me, I'm going to filter it before it gets to headquarters. Headquarters is right here. You get to the heart, the battle's over. You've lost the war. So I'm going to surround my heart with things to filter fluid. So the cervical nodes filter my head down. Why would you need an armpit filter? Oil. Right. So think about if I get cut on my hands and wrists and things, I have to go through the armpit to get to my heart. So I'm going to line my armpit, seems silly, with filters to protect the heart. Cut them off at the pass. Right? Hey, my intestines have lots of them. Why would intestines need nodes? Hmm. Parasites, right? You eat the E. coli special, something breaks in your intestines, you don't want to get into your heart. Right? So again, I'm going to surround the heart with filters. My groin, you know. That's to keep stuff from crawling up your leg and finding its way in your abdomen. So I'm wringing my chest basically with filters. No matter which way you want to get in, you have to get filtered before you get here in the right field condition. Make sense? Right. So when your doctor, when you're saying that you're swollen and the doctor starts to feel, right, your neck, armpit, groin, if you have an infection, what does the size of the nose do? Well, okay, swell. If there's more battles, I need more troops, my nodes get bigger. So when you have a sore throat, it went in your neck, your neck nodes are getting big, that puts pressure on your throat, you have a sore throat. Okay. So that's the concept as, as I fight more things, I need to filter more stuff, then filters get bigger. Okay. The next time you have a sore throat, you can just blame your lymph nodes for that. Here's another close-up picture. So this is showing lots of nodes in my armpit, lots of them around my intestines, lots of them in my neck. You know, here's my groiny land. Right? So places where I don't want things to get in. This picture is just because I'm a perfect biologist, but why not? Here's a giant boob, right? Why are there lymph nodes there? Right? Things can get in, right? There's fluid to drain. But if you notice, your breast drains to where? Your armpit. So, if your doctor feels that your armpit nodes are getting big on your yearly exam, what could be one reason? Breast cancer, right? So, cancer can break off, enter the fluid, end up in the drain line, and then end up in the filters. So, the further up you go, the closer to headquarters the cancer has gotten, right? So, the doctor's supposed to feel your nodes to keep a check on that. So if your nodes are getting bigger in your armpit for no real reason, maybe something broke off in here, it's trying to drain back to there. Mm -hmm. So they'll do a node biopsy to see how far up this chain of filters that your cancer has gotten. Okay? So, or nodectomies, I'll call it. The more nodes the cancer's in, the further the cancer has spread. Okay? Make sense? 
So anything that gets in the drain line could end up in a node. Cancer, pathogens, whatever. Make sense? All righty. So let's assume then something broke through my barriers, got through my inflammation, got through my lymph nodes, and it's just raising hell. What's my next line of defense? What could I do to try to kill it next time? Antibodies. Not yet. Fever. Fever. Fever is usually where we put it. I think the next time you have the flu, you'll probably want to figure out, ah, number one, number two, number three, number four. So the last one we'll do today is fever. Number four. All right, so let's talk about fever for a second. Oh, in the dark. That makes better. Fever. <laughs> Why do you want to be warm? Okay, there's two answers here. One is it increases your bone marrow speed. Someone, what does bone marrow have to do with any of this? Red production. Red and white blood cells, all your blood cells. So if I turn up the heat a little bit, my bone marrow can go faster. Remember biology 112, the enzymes? They go faster for a while. So if I can speed up my body, I can make more white blood cells, and the white blood cells go faster. So not only am I making more, but they can move quicker. Why would you want your army being faster? You can kill somebody before they kill you. So I'm speeding up my recruitment, I'm speeding up the speed of the soldier. That would improve my response. In addition, the fever decreases, for some odd reason, Bacterial growth, not every bacteria, mind you, and viral growth. The last time I read, they don't know how. But as you heat up, you get faster, they get slower. Your ideal conditions. Up to a point, right? 104, then you die. But that's the idea behind it. So if something gets in, I can then try to turn up the speed Fevers. So when you get a flu, your throat's sore, and then you get the fever. That's showing you the next response. So how do you make a fever? What part of your brain for your final exam would tell me to get hotter than normal? Your hypothalamus. Hypothalamus. Because what is your hypothalamus responsible for? Temperature homeostasis. regulation. So I'm changing my homeostasis of 98.6. I turn up the thermostat to some other number. So your hypothalamus says, I want to kill things, I'm going to turn up your heat. And then one day the fever breaks and the hypothalamus turns off the thermostat, and then you come back down. But fever is another line of defense. So fever implies you had an infection, because now I'm heating up to fight it. That's mm -hmm. All right, that's good for tonight. So we'll do the big immunity on Monday. Last quiz. Oh.